So I recently made a video talking about my immediate shock at the information that Bethesda seemingly doesn't like using good traditional design documentation practices to organize their developers and in turn their games. And people seem to have responded really well to that video. However, there are a number of corrections and clarifications that I would like to add to that conversation, and a good number of people have raised some very valid questions and some counterpoints that I do want to address. Something that I do want to make clear up front though, everything I'm going to say throughout this video, especially in regards to the development practices of Bethesda, is my own opinion based purely on what publicly available information that I can find. I'm not pretending to be clairvoyant, and I have the utmost respect for the hundreds of developers working at Bethesda. So as usual, I wish no ill will upon anyone, and please do not harass anyone at Bethesda just because I'm criticizing their games and my perception of their development process. Now, this video is technically a continuation of that prior video, so there will be a link in the cards and the description if you want to check that out first, but I also want this to be a sort of generally educational video about what a design document is and how important it is to maintain one when it comes to working on such large projects like, say, making a video game. So without much further ado, what is a game design document? So, a game design document is one of the core pieces of documentation that you typically use when making a game. It features all kinds of information about a given game. It's meant to be a living document that is accessible by everyone on the team. That way, if anyone has any question about what kind of game they're working on, or what the end product is supposed to be like, they can simply reference the document and understand what they need to be working towards. So what's actually in it then? Well, let's break it down piece by piece, and along the way I think I'll use some games as examples for the kinds of information that you'd want to write in your GDD. To start with, you usually begin by listing the most top-level abstract elements of your game. This can be a mission statement or the initial concept that the game is based on. It's common to list out things like what the main genres of the game are meant to be and any overarching themes that you're going for. Not to mention things like what your target audience is, or certain ideas that are meant to help set the game apart from its competition. And then you could move on to things like what the style of your game is meant to be like and the platforms that you're aiming to sell it on, because these are all key pieces of information that could affect widespread aspects of your game's design. So, if we were writing a GDD for just about any Zelda game as an example, we'd take note that a core selling point of their games is usually about exploration and puzzle solving. We'd make it clear that the game is meant to be enjoyable by audiences of all ages, and we'd note the limitations and features of whatever Nintendo's latest console is, since that would be the only platform that it'll be sold on. Once you got the basics established, then you usually start fleshing out the specifics about the game itself. I would usually start by focusing on the player character and what the player experience is meant to be like. This could include who the player character is, what their abilities are, and how they interact with the game. Basically, any mechanic of the game that relates to what the player themselves is specifically going to be able to do. So, if we were talking about Link in Tears of the Kingdom specifically, you would document everything from how fast he's able to walk, and how fast he can run, as well as how high he can jump, how climbing works, the various magic abilities that he's able to get both from the start of the game, like Recall and Ultra Hand, as well as any abilities that he might unlock throughout the adventure. The whole kit and caboodle. Now, it's important to recognize that, like I said, the GDD is meant to be a living document. That means you don't necessarily have to come up with every single detail of every mechanic and ability up front. Simply listing ideas for the abilities is usually enough when you're just starting a project. So, for example, with the Ultra Hand ability, I imagine that they only really came up with the most basic version of just sticking random physics objects together to start with. Then, as they came up with ideas for new Zonai devices, they would naturally add those to the documentation. And especially nuances like a character's exact run speed and jump height could change a lot during playtesting, so those sections may have to be updated regularly. But by doing so, now puzzle designers down the line can look over all of these details in the documentation and learn exactly what Link can interact with and go, oh hey, 
I can make a puzzle using this element and that element without having to constantly bug the programmers to figure out what states the current game mechanics are in. Once the player's core mechanics are established, I usually think it's a good idea to flesh things out around the player next, and then continue to build out more and more from there. So the next step might be to focus on the mechanics of the world that the player will be directly interacting with. Things like puzzle elements and the basic idea for what constitutes an enemy. Generally speaking, the kinds of obstacles that the player is expected to encounter and generally overcome on a regular basis. This isn't necessarily about specific level or encounter design just yet, more the basis for the mechanics that will be used in the game's level and encounter design. Once all the core gameplay features are established, usually what I would focus on next are the game's core gameplay loops. This is usually split up into at least three different tiers, depending on the scale of the loop, and these are pretty important to establish early on because they essentially provide the main reasons for your players to keep playing your game. Your primary gameplay loop is your moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. To switch to Baldur's Gate as an example, this would be the game's combat system primarily, with how the get player takes turns to try and defeat enemies while not dying themselves. But a game can and often has multiple primary gameplay loops, so, for example, exploring the map to find new areas is another primary gameplay loop. Talking to NPCs in order to learn something or gain their favor is another one, and solving puzzles is yet another one. The secondary gameplay loop thus usually encompasses multiple primary gameplay loops and is larger in scale, ranging from minutes to hours in length. So in Baldur's Gate, this would most generally be the game's level-up system. In order to gain a single level, you're probably going to have to participate in a large number of primary gameplay loops, going back and forth between combat exploration, talking to NPCs, and solving puzzles, all for the goal of trying to level up your character so that they can gain new abilities, which thus allow you to do new things in combat and solve puzzles in new ways. Finally, the tertiary gameplay loop is the loop that incentivizes the player to keep coming back to the game over the course of multiple play sessions, over the course of days, weeks, or even months. In Baldur's Gate, this would be the uncovering and experiencing the main story. And on an even grander scale, it could even include wanting to play the game again to try different builds so that the player can experience new and different content. And these gameplay loops are extremely important to define and get right about your game because what you're doing is you're essentially describing why your game is fun to play. A poorly defined or implemented primary gameplay loop can result in your game feeling needlessly repetitive or potentially even aimless. A bad secondary gameplay loop can mean that your player will fail to be engaged with your game for longer than just a few minutes. And a poorly made tertiary loop might mean that even if your player is having fun with their initial impression of the game, they might put it down and then never want to pick it back up again. And so at this point, once you've gotten a lot of the critical information written down, a game design document usually splits off into numerous sub-documents that focus in on more specific aspects of your game. So you might have documents about level design to start fleshing out the main content of your game, story documents for the narrative, te technical documentation for your coders, art style guides to keep your artists all consistent with each other, and so on. And it's worth pointing out that a GDD and all these other offshoot documents are rarely just like a big Google Doc that everyone shares a link to. It can be, of course, especially for a smaller scale project, but when it comes to such large employees that might be managing hundreds if not thousands of workers on a single project, they likely have proprietary software for helping manage the documentation in a way more similar to, say, a wiki. I've seen some developers mention that they essentially use a GitHub repository to both distribute and track changes to their documentation. So as such, things like your technical documentation and your art style guide might be part of the same overarching documentation system that you use at the company, but they are also divided usually into their own sections of the architecture to make them more easily searchable so that the relevant people can get to the most relevant information that they need to know.
I could go on and on about more of the specifics about the kinds of things that you would document after that point, but I think most people get the idea by now. And to be fair, there is no real singular way to write a GDD either. Depending on the game, different priorities may take hold, and as a result, things might be organized differently. A more story-heavy game might list key plot points and character details before their relevant mechanics, and something like a strategy game might not really have a singular player character to write an entire section about. The exact way you go about making one may change from game to game, but ultimately the point is that your GDD acts like the skeleton, or the blueprints of your game. And more often than not, those blueprints can and will change over time as the realities of the world influence the direction of things, which is why it's so important to keep it up to date. Because if you're not, then you might have entire teams of people who think that they're working on a completely different vision of the game than what everyone else is, and that is just a recipe for disaster. Coders could be working on mechanics that have already been cut, artists could be drawing a background for a level whose theme has been reworked into something completely different. Everyone ends up wasting time and resources, and the game just becomes harder and harder to stay focused and cohesive. Now, if all you came to this video for was to learn a little bit of behind-the-scenes info on how games are made, and what a key part of the development process that good documentation is, then I guess you can stop here. And if you have any more questions about game development and the like, then by all means, let me know down in the comments below, and a like or a sub would be greatly appreciated. But if you want to see me talk a little bit more specifically about Bethesda and Starfield, as well as to address some of the common questions and criticisms from that prior video in regards to the importance of documentation, then by all means, stick around for the rest. So let's move on to our first question. But what about agile development, or other ways of making games? I've seen some people commenting that there are always other methods of making a game, and not every studio should be necessarily restricted to the same methods and formulas that something like a GDD might enforce. The term agile development got tossed around a lot, along with things like iterative design, which I think even Emil himself touches on in his presentation that I talked about. And obviously, there is no single correct way to make a game. What works for me might not work well for you, or vice versa. The thing to recognize, though, is that a GDD is not a methodology or a style of development. It doesn't impose some kind of formula on the developers. It is merely a tool. It is functionally, at its most basic explanation, just the idea of writing things down so that you don't forget them. And as such, it can be incorporated into virtually any style of development that exists. And while yes, things like agile development do exist as a strategy, and one of its core tenets is to prioritize working functional software over extensive documentation. But it still acknowledges that the latter is still important. Both sides of the equation are relevant, and if we're being honest with ourselves, Bethesda rarely seems to be focusing on working software for most of their catalog. I mean, Microsoft mentioned that they put their own QA team on Starfield, and were probably the ones that suggested they delay the game for a year for the sake of polishing out a lot of the bugs. So it seems like we can't even credit Bethesda all that much for making Starfield be considerably less buggy than their previous output. Also, Agile development is more typically meant to be used for things like live services, as the core idea of Agile development is more about getting feedback from customers and then trying to iterate and push out regular updates to address that feedback as quickly as possible so that you can keep your customer base happy. You can apply some of the same techniques when making a game with a good enough QA team, I guess, or when a game is already out and it's something like an MMO or a live service experience. But long-term single-player games that take years to develop and don't typically get regular updates is not really the same thing, nor what the traditional meaning of the way agile development is meant to be used really works, at least as far as I understand it. And in general, I mentioned this a few times before, but again, a GDD is meant to be a living document. It is something that naturally grows and changes over time along with development. 
It is not a fault in the system that you need to update it regularly, it's how it's meant to work and just a natural facet of good management. If you're using an agile development strategy, that means you need to constantly be keeping track of feedback as well as what needs to be changed and iterated on. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like something that would be a lot easier to manage with good documentation. If you already have a proper living game design document, then it'd only be easier to iterate off of it and apply feedback to it. And just in general, regardless of what style of development that you're going for, if you have a cool idea that you didn't have at the start, and it ends up being added to the game, then you just add it to the GDD, so that people know what it is and how it works. If another idea isn't working out, you remove it. And having the GDD can help you evaluate potential ideas for new mechanics or objectives or whatever long before you get to the point of implementing them. Emil mentioned in his talk that he preferred to have ideas put into the game in order to test them out and see how they play before fully evaluating them. But I think that that only makes it extremely easy to waste precious dev time on mechanics that won't make it into the final product. Maybe it breaks the game due to some unforeseen interaction with another of the game's mechanics, or it's just not fun or something like that. These problems could potentially be pointed out long ahead of time by just theorycrafting things on paper. Sure, it's hard to evaluate every idea on paper, but doing so can still provide a lot of insight about how good or bad an idea might be long before you get to the point of implementation. I'm not saying that you'll always catch bad ideas early on with good documentation, but not documenting things is only making things harder on yourself, and you will inevitably waste tons of time if you focus on trying to implement every new idea just to see how it works out in the game. To me, not wanting to use a good living game design document during your development process is nearly as absurd as saying something like, I'm going to make a game that bucks industry trends. You see, when most people code, they use a program like Visual Studio to manage their code. But I'm going to change things up by using Notepad instead. It's not exactly revolutionary to arbitrarily impose that kind of pointless challenge on yourself. You're not about to realize some kind of brand new undiscovered technique by just tossing out an, an extremely commonly used and well-tested tool. And if anything, you're only sabotaging your own efforts by making things harder on yourself for no good reason. But is it actually worth the time it takes to keep updating a game design document? So. I mentioned in the original video that I thought it was absurd for Emil to say that updating the GDD isn't worth the time that it takes to do, but I really want to drive home how absurd I think this claim is. For one, Bethesda, or any AAA studio for that matter, are by definition not small indie developers. They could literally just hire someone, hell, an entire team of people whose sole job it is to manage their documentation for them. They could be making rounds around the office, double checking everyone's work, and helping make sure that everyone is on the same page. As I mentioned in the original video, this is a completely normal thing for someone to do, mainly because it's typically the job of the team lead to do it. It is quite literally what it means to manage your developers as the gameplay director, or as a gameplay lead for a specific system in the game. It is also important to recognize the scale of the issue that we're talking about here. Let's say that for the sake of example, due to some mess up, your team of 100 developers ends up working off of, say, an outdated model of the game for only one day, but now tomorrow they need to redo a lot of their work because you informed them of some critical change far too late. Now, wasting only a single day of development doesn't sound that bad, but in reality, that's eight hours of work across a hundred different people that has gone to waste. So in total, that's 800 man hours of effort or the equivalent of 33 nonstop days that has just gone down the drain which is literally, like, more than an entire month 
And if it's possible to avoid a problem like this by just putting in a couple extra hours for a single person or a handful of people to just go ahead and update the documentation so that everyone is up to date, then you're comparing a handful of hours versus an entire month's worth of effort being lost. So unless updating the documentation is for some reason taking entire months of work, then it's probably going to be worth it to keep working on updating that documentation for the sake of the time and effort of the hundreds and hundreds of developers that might be within your employ. And honestly, I know that Emil mentions that they prefer to iterate on their design quickly, essentially constantly changing to play and improve their game based on feedback over and over again, like I mentioned with Agile Development. And I don't disagree with the idea that constant playtesting is a good idea for making a fun game. But in the context of developing a game with such a huge team, you would think you would want to document things even more than usual in order to keep track of all that constant feedback, as well as all of the new changes that you keep making. If your design and mechanics are constantly changing on a week-to-week, -week, month month-to-month basis because you're going through a cycle of iteration, that means that teams of other people, like level designers, might be working on a completely outdated notion of what the current game is like for weeks or even months at a time with little idea as to what the direction of the final product is going in. And as such, they might have to keep constantly scrapping and redoing their work, which just keeps wasting more and more time and effort that could have been avoided with good management and documentation and communication. So here's a question that's a little bit more specific to Bethesda specifically. How do we know that Bethesda is still using this technique when the talk that I was referencing is from 2016? Now, first of all, I want to reiterate, I am not clairvoyant. I have no way of directly confirming that Bethesda has continued to buck the tradition of using design documents when making their games. This is merely my own speculation and opinion based off of what little publicly available information that I have found to date. However, I still think that you have a good reason to suspect that this is still the case when it came to how they developed Starfield. Emil mentions during his talk that they started to disregard design documentation during the development of Fallout 3. Now, some quick Google searches will reveal that Fallout 3 started development in 2004, and allegedly it finished development sometime before it came out in 2008. This means that by 2016, they had apparently already been doing this practice for the better part of a decade, and had developed the entirety of Skyrim and Fallout 4 under this new system. On top of that, it's important to recognize the realities of game development and essentially how long it takes to make a game. Bethesda has stated numerous times publicly that they started development of Starfield right after they finished Fallout 4, which means that it's entirely possible, if not probable, that they could have already been in pre-production when Emil gave this talk bragging about how they don't like using good documentation practices. And I think that it would be weird if he gave this talk going on about how they make games and then immediately decided to go against himself and do things completely differently on their immediate next project that they had just started working on. And I mean, sure, I guess it's technically possible for that to have happened, but I personally find it a little bit hard to believe. So honestly, right now, I really see no reason to think that they've changed these practices during Starfield's development, especially when the game itself, in my opinion, serves as clear enough evidence on its own of poor management and organization. Plus, let's be honest with ourselves, there was already evidence, even before Fallout 3, that Bethesda was already really bad at managing their paperwork. If, even if they hadn't necessarily thrown out the idea of using a game design document entirely at that point. Rather infamously, the voice actors for Oblivion were allegedly given their lines in alphabetical order. <laughs> 
which means that they would have had to have record thousands of lines without any real context for any of the dialogue surrounding them. Not to mention that it means that they were recording tons of very similar lines back to back, like going, hey, hello, hi, how are you doing, and so on and so forth. Which would mean, of course, that of course a lot of those lines would sound very repetitive and disjointed. It's just an absolutely bonkers way to record thousands of lines for your game. And and in my opinion, it's only kind of sad to realize that it's entirely possible that their organizational practices have only seemed to get worse from there. Or at the very least, it doesn't feel like they've gotten a lot better. But some of Bethesda's games were still good, so doesn't that invalidate the idea that their development strategy is bad? So. I've seen a good number of people try to defend Bethesda in this manner, essentially pointing out that games like Fallout 3 and Skyrim are still highly praised games to this day, and that shows that this strategy can work. Thus, there must be some other factor at play to explain why the quality has dropped off so much with Fallout 4, 76, and Starfield. And on the surface, this seems like a very valid point. Now, first of all, I might as well say that I personally have grown more and more sour on Bethesda's whole catalog over time. Like, don't get me wrong, I played tons of Fallout 3 and Skyrim back in the day, but I still wonder how much of my enjoyment of those games comes more from the fact that they came out at a time when massive open-world RPGs were much more of a rarity, and as such, Bethesda's games felt way more unique. In the modern day, in a post-Breath of the Wild, post-Elden Ring, post Baldur's Gate 3 world, the idea of going back to play a game like Skyrim just kind of feels incredibly unappealing to me, especially with the idea of playing it raw with no mods to help smooth out the bumps that people have been pointing out for years. But regardless of my opinion on those games, obviously lots of people still love all of their games to this day, up to and even including Starfield. But even if you do love all of Bethesda's catalog and think that they are amazing masterpieces of video game fiction, I still don't think that them being good games invalidates my point that avoiding good documentation is a generally bad thing to do. It's important to recognize that bad development strategies don't always result in bad games. Obviously, there are countless other factors to consider that might be able to cover some of the weaknesses of neglecting one thing or another. So, I'm not about to pretend that the lack of a good design document is the sole reason why Bethesda games have been going downhill. But it is, in my opinion, a symptom of larger issues with management that can result in these issues that only keep getting worse and worse over time. If management is not willing to keep their documentation up to spec, then what else are they neglecting when it comes to organizing their employees and making sure their game comes out cohesively? I personally think that Bioware is a rather good example of what I mean with the information that we now know. Rather famously, after Anthem came out, Jason Schreier put out an article revealing just how bad things were behind the scenes, not just for Anthem, but for many of Bioware's biggest hits, including the entire Mass Effect trilogy and of course some of the Dragon Age games. Essentially, they were constantly floundering and wandering aimlessly in development hell for most of the time that they worked on each of these famous games, and only had things start to finally come together in around the last year and a half or so when they would start imposing insane amounts of crunch time on their employees and just kind of hope that the quote-unquote Bioware magic would just save the day. And so, despite clearly lacking good time management skills and putting their employees through sheer unethical amounts of overtime crunch, they still put out some amazing games. After all, the Mass Effect trilogy is still iconic to this very day. But I can only imagine what those games could have been if they were better managed so that they could have made better use of their whole development cycle instead of just overworking their employees to death at the final stretch. 
but they probably saw the high praise that their games got as justification to keep employing the strategy and to just keep neglecting the clear underlying issues at their studio. So naturally things only kept getting worse and worse over time until it eventually fell apart. And now I don't think that anyone is surprised that this insane strategy eventually stopped working out and we ended up getting games like Mass Effect Andromeda and Anthem. So yeah, to try and put some kind of a bow on this whole discussion, maybe you can make a good game without using a design document, or other various commonly used tools that have been tried and tested for decades, but you're only doing so in spite of not using these obvious tools, and managing to pull it off once or twice should not be justification to keep on doing these bad practices, because eventually neglecting this kind of stuff is gonna come around and bite you in the ass down the line. And ultimately, as I've said multiple times at this point, I don't personally know what's going on behind closed doors at Bethesda. Maybe they do have extensive design documentation that details all the core mechanics of their game. But when the final product that they put out is so disjointed and incoherent that it feels like nobody was ever writing anything down, then I think that that only says something even more damning about how poorly managed and organized the game's development was. I mean, just look at how Starfield feels as an overall experience when you try to put together the sum of its parts compared to other games like Baldur's Gate or Zelda or even indie scale projects like Bug Fables and The Outer Wilds. Those games have a much more clear focus to them. It doesn't feel like they just suddenly added a bunch of new mechanics and systems because they sounded cool and then they had to scramble around at the last minute to make them feel relevant to the rest of the game. Mechanics like Zelda's recall and ultra hand abilities not only well fleshed out mechanics but play integral roles to the game's world building and story. I mean, could you imagine a world where they randomly decided to add an ability like Ascend only at the last minute, and then now suddenly a ton of devs had to suddenly waste a lot of their time going back and rebuilding and retesting their puzzles, editing the world design and everything, because when you add a new ability like that, it could potentially cause the entire game to fall apart. And yet, that's kind of what it feels like is going on behind closed doors at Bethesda. So, I could have ended the video here, but while I was working on this video, Emil actually put out a series of tweets that were clearly made in response to a lot of the recent waves of criticisms that Starfield has been getting. So I felt that I should probably comment on them directly. I'll put them up on screen now if you want to read through them yourself, but ultimately, as usual, it feels like Emil is using a lot of words to say very little, and the ultimate point that I think he's trying to say in defense of Starfield is just that making games is hard. And look, I understand that making a game, especially a AAA game, is hard. Even the tiny projects that I have worked on required a ton of blood, sweat, and tears. And they're just tiny little things that aren't even that good at the end of the day. And as I said at the start, I have all the respect in the world for the hundreds of ground level developers at Bethesda because more often than not when a game comes out in the state that it has it's not because the programmers didn't know how to write good code it's not because the artists don't know how to draw it's not because the level designers don't know how to make a good level more often than not when a big project like a game is bad it's because of the shortcomings of management and when I look back on Starfield's development, there's just a number of factors that you have to consider. Like, I can't exactly say that Starfield was a particularly rushed game when it was given upwards of seven years or more of development time, and it was even delayed for a year towards the end. I can't say that Starfield was lacking in funding when it's reported to have a budget of hundreds of millions of dollars, not to mention that it recently gained the backing of Microsoft. I can't say that Starfield was short-staffed because Bethesda has hundreds of employees and potentially thousands of contractors at their beck and call. And like I just said, I highly doubt that all of those employees are just somehow woefully incompetent at their job. 
And I know that it's a meme to say that Bethesda's game engine is trash, but honestly, I don't think we can even lay that much blame on the game engine either, at least for not the core issues with the game's design. And I think that it's telling that the main points that Emil brings up in his Twitter thread about how hard game development is include statements about things like deadlines, shifting schedules, having to make tough decisions about when it comes to cutting content and choosing what direction the game has to go in. These are all issues, though, that can be resolved by good management and organization. Games, especially large-scale AAA games, live and die by the quality of how they are managed, and when we have evidence that the lead designer of the game doesn't like using basic documentation practices to keep all of his employees on the same page, I can't help but feel like that's a symptom of a larger issue with management at Bethesda. <sighs> but... I guess I'm just some random scrub tier indie developer with less than a thousand subs on YouTube. So what do I know? Thanks for giving me your time and watching to the end of the video. And if you thought about anything that I said today was interesting or informative, then a like or a subscribe would not go unappreciated. I'll see you guys later, and who knows? Maybe Elder Scrolls 6 will finally be the one where they get their act together. I guess only time will tell.